isolation. For some a blessing, and for others a curse. Regardless of your standpoint, the undeniable truth is that horrors are guaranteed when in the middle of nowhere. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. About seven years ago, I was on a backpacking trip with three friends, one a ranger, and the rest of us biology and botany nerds. And all four of us saw something that we cannot still explain. Day one went off without a hitch. It was a bit long, and there was a lot of elevation gain, but nonetheless, we set up camp and heated up some nice beans and rice under what can only be described as the clearest summer skies I can recall. This is up in Washington state and the night sky from the mountains are just unreal. The second day was different. All four of us awoke shortly before dusk to a sure scream. Not super uncommon. Most of us are pretty seasoned hikers and campers and backpackers. The sound of something getting killed is pretty universal. None of us could quite make it out. If I remember correctly, we mostly assumed it was a coyote. Anyway, it was pretty close, which is probably why it woke us all up. So we started scoping out a small radius around the campsite. We found what looked like somebody had put a bomb inside an animal. No evidence of an actual explosive, however. I'm just trying to give you the same picture I had in my head. A totally indecipherable heap of flesh and fur, probably about the size of a German Shepherd with similar fur coloration too. We discussed how odd it was for a bit, then decided more or less, eh, what are you gonna do? and moved on. Best explanation was something tore into it and bailed. Maybe by the sound of us waking us up. On the third day, we're winding down from a fairly short day of hiking. We were all tired, I suppose. I remember us joking about being old farts now and not being able to hustle like we would a few years prior. The sun was just making its way down over the tree line while we busted out the whiskey and started boiling a pot of water for more beans and rice. I'll never forget this. One of the crew was just launching into a story about his ex and it went something like this. Yeah, so she was just about the worst possible kind of and then he gets cut off by a loud pop which we all unanimously recognized and described as a tree's last leg snapping before it falls. We're all standing now, scanning the tree line. We're in a small clearing, aside from the single large tree we're next to. A few minutes go by without a sound, nothing. Then we start hearing the forest's life make noise again. We all settle back in, presuming the tree would lean up against another tree instead of hitting the forest floor. But it sounded pretty close. Even though there weren't too many trees we needed to be concerned about, i.e. it couldn't reach us if it fell in the middle of the night. Then another wail, like the one we heard on the first night, except more distant. I never sensed it, but one of the crew said it sounded like it was coming from a cave like it echoed. So we went looking for a cave in that general direction. We were out for about 45 minutes before one of us suggested we should head back as we were going to be out of sunlight soon. Never did we find anything like a cave that could explain the reverberation. More importantly, it was starting to get dark and we were a little away from the safety of our tents. Heading back towards the clearing, and our campsite from the woods. Something catches my friend's eye. Did you see that? He's pointing across the clearing about nine o'clock. We're taking a direct path to our campsite, 
So it's dead ahead at 12. We're all looking in that direction, scanning the tree line. Where what? Dude, I'm telling you there, right there, was a person just beyond camp. He's visibly shaken by it. It's pretty obvious he wasn't fooling around or thought he could be mistaken. And if you're wondering, shaken, because we're no way near a road or town, and even the nearest trail is miles away. A handful of times, I've run into other backpackers in similar ways, people checking out your camp, heading the direction of your fire. So the rest of us are pretty open, let's go check it out, but not our buddy. He suggested we all take a knee and wait and hide in the tree line's cover. So there we are, kneeling in the brush, staring at our own campsite from the other side of the clearing, when we all unanimously see a figure start to move against the brush from 9 to 8 to 7, counterclockwise. Remember, we're at effectively 6 o'clock, so this becomes increasingly unsettling. I remembered noticing our ranger buddy readying his rifle, and another friend putting a hand on his knife. I'm pretty sure we're all feeling the same uneasiness now. I say we saw a figure, but really, we could just hear and occasionally see the brush moving in the area. My ranger buddy declares it's just a bear. The original spotter, whispering his argument, is standing like a person. We decide that either way, getting into the clearing and making our presence known is the best choice. We either need to scare off this bear or confront this person. So we all stand up and jog into the clearing shouting, Hey, bear! This is more or less standard procedure in case you're wondering. All being sure to keep our eyes towards the area, we last heard and saw something moving. Nothing happens. Nothing at all. We're all just standing in the middle of the clearing, somewhere about halfway between six o'clock position and our camp, just waiting for something to happen. We're about 20 minutes away from total darkness, when there's another wail from four o'clock. Remember we're all staring towards seven o'clock? I whirl around before realizing one of us was already looking that way, and his face is totally pale. There's a bunch of adrenaline here, and everything is happening pretty fast. And I'll never forget catching the look on his face before I fully turned around. Then I saw it too. We all did. There's a silhouette of a tall man leaning over something else, facing away from us. And then he clearly rests on one knee before turning to look our way. Our ranger buddy has his rifle in the air. Hey, who the hell is... He's about to lay his aim for hunting, when the figure comes to full stand. It's hard to gauge, probably about six foot, and then absolutely takes off away from us. I don't mean like a man scrambling to run away, or a bear bounding off into the bush. I mean like Usain Bolt, as if he were born and raised in the mountains. Never in my life have I ever seen anything like it. And I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. My first reaction was ghost. After a pretty long wait and arguing about what we have to do, we swing back to the camp to grab a few flashlights and our lamp. It's now past dawn and getting pretty dark. We make our way over to where the figure was leaning and another mound of flesh. Without getting too detailed, this time, some unmistakable fox paws were intermixed. Again, it looked like it was exploded open, and the meat eaten on the spot, not harvested like a hunter. You probably wouldn't be surprised to hear we didn't sleep much that night. We make jokes about encountering the Sasquatch out there. I've never been a spiritual man, and still I'm not. But it's very difficult to shake the inhuman yet human supernatural nature of the way it looked and moved. Shadowy, and none of us could make out any kind of clothing that would break up its silhouette. 
since we could barely see any details anyway. We all figured an actual person's silhouette would be a bit more chopped by wearing a jacket, carrying something, a hat or whatever. And not to mention, I've never personally seen something kill quite like that. Closest thing I've seen is a deer carcass, post bear, in a time of year that would have made it very hungry and aggressive. Which wouldn't have been during our late summer hike. What gets me is we heard the same shrill wail three times, and the distance between our two sites and our day three site was close to 10 miles, meaning we were on the same general trail as it was, though none of us noticed any trail markings, either that or it was following us. A buddy and I were hiking the Appalachian Trail, only the North Carolina to South Carolina portion. It was summer, the weather was great, and we cross into South Carolina and meet a super nice elderly couple and talk with them and ate lunch. We made camp about half a mile from them after we part ways. So, we are about to fall asleep in our tent, when we hear some rustling in the bush around the campsite. That's fairly common there, as there are a shit ton of squirrels and other animals around. The rustling didn't sound like a squirrel after a while, and it was actually multiple sounds coming from multiple places around us. My first thought, being a southerner who hunts, was that it was a pack of skidding coyotes. I was so wrong. We started hearing what sounded like low level incantations. So after a few minutes, I'm fairly relieved that I don't have to fight coyotes. But then I remember that Carolina mountain folk can be some weird people. The chanting gets closer, and we can audibly hear what appears to be about 10 men clearly and repeatedly chanting, Lord help us, Lord save us. It was similar to low level and slow rhythmic monk chants. Well, that's creepy as shit. So I decide to let anyone near our tent know that we are armed inside. I take out the magazine, because I don't want to inject a round, and pull the slide back, and let go to clearly make the sound of a gun being racked. Obviously I put the magazine in, and the chamber around after. That sound must have done the trick, because they walked past us. They were literally walking through our campsite to get to some type of gathering. We didn't sleep that night at all. It was the last night of our trip for us, so we kind of brushed it off to crazy weird capping off of the trip. Two days later, we were hanging out with some friends, and on a TV in the background happened to be the local news. There was a story running about an elderly hiking couple found murdered on the Appalachian Trail about two miles from where we were camping. They showed their pictures and sure enough it was the couple we met. They had been murdered and dismembered, and their body parts were found organised around a ritual site, like they were placed specifically according to some crazy demonic seance. We literally could have been swooped up by those men, and that could have happened to us. And all that time, I think about that poor couple and what happened to them. Carolina mountain people, I really are breed sometimes. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the Great American Road Trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s pretty broke, as my mom had been a long-haul trucker. I suggested 
that to save a ton of money, we should sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of our first week, we'd gotten so we could set up camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, and basically anywhere that seemed safe and semi-legal. There were never a night, after the first night anyway, where we felt scared until the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive for more than three or four hours a day. No destination really in mind outside a few must-see landmarks. We drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of rednecks we met at a campsite in the back of their pickup because I got hungry and overheard them saying they were going there too. We met an 80 year old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar. Played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm and got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them. We spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Basically, every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up into the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately, while it was still light out, we goofed around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met so many cool people in the previous five weeks just by going up and offering beers or just chatting. So we wandered over. Near the campfire, there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing and we spent several hours just chatting to him about our trip, families, everything. He then started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite 
and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of for one of us to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, if you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow, joke on the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed, as well as joked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within five minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about something grabbing us from out of our car in the middle of the night. No matter how much we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back onto it. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We'd just awkwardly laugh and sip our beers to try and get on the conversation and see if it hopefully led elsewhere. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point it's pitch black and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside the circle. Suddenly there is a red dot in the darkness and it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen on the digital camera light up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to ask to take pictures with us. My friend Tez is gorgeous, dark hair, blue eyes, like a young Megan Fox. And we were friendly people. And liked having pictures taken with others. It was an entirely strange thing to have this person take a photo of us without asking or even indicating that that was going to be what he was going to do. We were both staring at him like deer in headlights at this point. But instead of realizing what he's doing is a bit weird, he checks his camera adjust some things and takes another photo, this time with the flash. No asking for us to smile, no posing a group photo, and no explanation. After the photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down, and not a word is said about it. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make some bullshit excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the hell out of there. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. However, the ranger looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, be careful out there. There are more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either, because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV, and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take a picture of us? I was shaking. I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She was in a full panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off because now he knows exactly where our car is. God knows why, but that is the only night we did not set up camp. We didn't need to tear anything down 
so we just put the car in drive and floored it out of the campsite. As we got onto the dirt road, the ranger was walking towards our car with some cold expression. As you can obviously tell by the fact this story is being told, we found another place to crash for the night. Unfortunately, weren't his next victims. I don't know if he is a serial killer or not, but regardless, he certainly knows how to creep a pair of girls out. You see, some interesting things working nights as a janitor, such as a life-size doll under the bank president's desk. You learn some hilarious quirks, like an official wanting the vacuum marks perfectly parallel on his carpet, because he gets upset otherwise. Sometimes you see things you can't quite explain, like the reflection of a dog in a mirror that is never there when you turn around, but shows up night after night. Some things are quite chilling, like when the building music would switch on by itself as I turned the lights out. Of course, being in empty buildings alone at night made everything take on an extra dimension of spookiness. One of the only things that truly scared me, however, because it was more tangible than the mirror dog ever could be, and potentially more dangerous than glitchy Muzak. It was a miserable night, with blizzard conditions that are not uncommon in winter here. The wind was howling, snow was blowing, and it was dangerously cold. Altogether, the kind of night you don't want to be out in. My last building for the night was in the outskirts of town, in the real middle of nowhere. There were no nearby houses, and nothing in that area was open at night. In short, there was no reason for anyone to be out there, especially in that weather. The building was not a spooky one, just isolated. I made an absolute habit of always, always locking the doors of the building that I was working in, because even in a safe town, a female janitor alone at night seems like too easy a target. That night was no different. I know I locked that door, and if I hadn't closed it firmly, the strong wind would have. I went about my usual routine, turning all the lights on on all three floors, and then setting up my supplies. The building had an odd layout, with a sort of bird's nest loft, that the boss's office was in, overlooking the main floor. I usually started with a loft and headed up there, but realized I had forgotten something and headed back down. I was distracted and this building always annoyed me, but I wasn't listening to music and didn't even have earbuds in. So I was very reasonably alert. So I was a little surprised to find the side door standing wide open, with the wind rushing in and snow already drifting up. I froze a bit, because there was no reason that door should be open. I checked the parking lot quickly, in case the building owner had for some reason showed up in the middle of the night. No cars but mine. After locking the door, I shut the building. I started searching the building. Starting with the basement, I didn't see anyone, and nothing was disturbed. As my search reached the loft level, the reflection of the basement lights in the stairwell went out. Then the lights on the main floor went out, and I heard the door bang open and rattle in the wind. So I shut myself in the office for a while. Eventually, I admitted that I had to finish the building, or I would probably get fired. So I locked that door for the third time that night, turned all the lights back on, and cleaned faster than I ever had before. I should have called the police, but luckily, nothing happened that night, or on any other nights since. 
This happened a few months ago. I am a female, and at the time, I was 18. Now, I live with my mother, stepfather, and younger brother in a three-bedroom apartment on the bottom floor. It is a nice place with two balconies, which are about eight feet off the ground, because the building is built on a rather steep hill in an isolated area. Now the front door of the apartment is self-closing, and when it closes by itself, it slams rather loudly. Now my family had decided to leave and go for some Indian tacos, and since I was home, they didn't bother to lock the door. I decided to stay home because I am an introverted extrovert and had already been social enough that day and I wanted some me time. My family is located in a town in Nebraska that doesn't really have much crime. It is nothing like the part of the town that we originated from. It is a town full of military families that have plenty of money. Pretty much the only thing to worry about are the little city brats who have been spoiled so much they think they can get away with anything. Anyway, the apartment setup is quite simple. You have the front door with a little hallway, which, if you go right, you then have the living room, kitchen and dining room. Then if you go left, there is another hallway which has three bedrooms and a bathroom. Now my room is the very first one in the hall. One cannot pass my room without me knowing. This was an intentional choice when we moved here, due to my anxiety and PTSD. I have problems with paranoia because of past experiences. My little brother was intentionally put between my bedroom and my parents at the end of the hall because of said paranoia. Mainly, my need to check on my family members after I've had one of my terrible nightmares. Now, I had laid back on my futon in my room, and I had my bedroom door closed so that I could enjoy my privacy without my anxiety kicking in and making me think someone in the apartment was with me. I was listening to true horror stories through my headphones and reading Naruto fanfiction on my phone. When I heard the front door open and close, I glanced at the clock, and it read 7.36pm. I thought, okay, they're back, and my little brother will follow the same routine and burst into my room without knocking to bug me and let me know that they were home. I waited. Nothing. No yell from my mum that they were home. No jingling of keys. No door opening. Nothing. I took off my headphones and listened. I could hear someone walking on the carpet. The familiar swish noise of footsteps travelled around the whole apartment. I waited, my anxiety rising up in my throat before the calm came. Now the problem that I have with my anxiety and other issues, is that everything happens as a delayed reaction. During a crisis, I am able to act completely calm and in control. But after I am in a safe place, I break down completely. I sat on my futon opening my mouth, slightly, to quiet my breathing. Smooth, slow breaths through my nose and mouth at the same time. My heart was still pounding. I looked at the door to my room, waiting, thinking that it must just be me hearing things again. Then apartment walls and such. I then heard the person walk down the hall and try to open my parents' bedroom. I stared at my door even harder. I heard them turn and walk back down the hall, stopping halfway. Shit. They must have seen the light under my door, I thought. I watched the door 
not wanting to move from my futon and have the metal futon stand make a loud creaking noise. They came to my door and I heard them touch it. The instant I saw the door move slightly from them putting weight on it, I jumped up and ran to the door. Now the entryway to my room has the door inside a little square area. So I ran over and put my back against the wall and put both feet on the door. I grabbed a nearby blanket and put it at the bottom of the door. I watched the door handle and it never moved. They never even touched it. The person on the other side just kept pushing on my closed door and latched a door. No lock, just me holding it closed. I felt the door push against the weight of my legs and feet. I knew I wasn't imagining this shit. I could actually feel the door move. I still had my phone in my hand. I quickly turned to call the volume all the way up and dialed 911. A man answered and I gave him my address. The volume so loud you could hear the conversation, as if the phone was on speaker. And I explained the situation to the dispatcher, and we talked for a bit. He asked me if I had something to defend myself, and I told him I had pepper spray in my purse, but that it was eight feet away from my bedroom door, and laughingly said that it's probably not a good idea right now. The dispatcher agreed with me. Now, during all of this, the person on the other side of my door had been listening, and it seemed as if they finally understood that I had called 911 because I heard them run through my apartment, over to one of the balcony doors, rip it open and run out. I informed the operator of this, and we continued talking until the cops arrived and they checked. Nothing was taken, and nothing was moved as far as I could tell. My family arrived to the cops being there and were freaking out. My mother nearly went mama bear, she was so freaked. So that's the story, why you should always lock your doors even if you're at home. I went backpacking with my cousin about four miles into the Angeles National Forest. We set up camping during the day and went on with our normal backpacking routines. Come nightfall, we each go into our individual tents and call it a night. Around 3 a.m., I start hearing light scratching on my tent, as if rats were trying to get in. I smacked the side of the tent a few times to scare them away, but nothing. It just intensified. I couldn't pinpoint from which part of the tent the scratching was coming from, so I kept smacking. Nothing. At this point, I look over at my dog and he's looking at me like, I ain't going out there. So I try to ignore it and go back to sleep, but I can't. It's freaking me out and I don't want to leave my tent to investigate. So after a while, my cousin calls out to me, hey man, have you been hearing shit outside? Cause I've been hearing footsteps around my tent. So now we're debating going out to check it out or not. We don't. Eventually the sounds went away, but we didn't fall asleep for the rest of the night. In the morning we checked our campsite, and there was nothing. No traces of anything. No tracks, no scratches on my tent, poop, nada. We promptly packed up, and got the hell out of there. I had a business trip that took me to Arizona and didn't want to pass up a chance to visit some great views and hiking in Sedona. So worked it into a long weekend. I got up early one morning to hit the trail before the pink jeeps descended upon some of the more visited places. First stop was a previous Anasazi site purely for historical reasons. After hiking in from the road by foot, I got a good 30 minutes at the site 
before the first jeep tour showed up, packed up my day, and headed down the trail. My second goal that morning was a fairly gradual but scenic hike up the side of a nearby mesa. However, the weather that day wasn't cooperating, and I kept my eye on some thunderstorms to the south that were building. As I continued to gain altitude on the switchback trail, I had a beautiful view over the valley towards Cathedral Rock. The low clouds filled in and began to build, and some downpours were visible, but no strikes landing on the mesas in the rain and lightning. I picked up my pace and made the lip of the mesa, walking slowly to a smooth rocky outcropping with great views and to catch my breath. I wasn't sure what caused me to it, but I took off my hat, turned around and looked up. I saw low scud clouds with wispy tendrils slowly swirling in a circle overhead. The outer fringe was dark grey, the central core a lighter shade, and suddenly before my eyes, I saw a large wingspan bird appear from the centre of the swirl, all dark, not the coloration of an eagle, and with the wing feathers separated, like a turkey or vulture, but even larger. I watched the bird as it drifted, sometimes with mostly again, the direction of rotation of the cloud swirl, and I don't recall seeing it flap. I took a quick moment to look south at the advancing storm, and saw my first lightning strike well off in the distance. I looked up at the bird again, it made a right hand turn for the centre of the swirl, and then vanished as it cruised across the centre of the swirl once more. I stood there for a good five minutes, processing what I'd seen, waiting for it to reappear, but nothing. Truly a mesmerising natural encounter. I grabbed my pack and made tracks down the trail to make it to the vehicle before the storm that was approaching fast. Being alone on the trip, I really had no one to discuss it with, and mulled over the experience for the rest of the afternoon. I took a warm shower, dressed up, and then drove to an Italian restaurant, newly opened on the main drag in town. They didn't seat until 5pm, so I wandered into the German mineral shop next door to find some mementos to give to my friends when I got back home. The lady behind the counter wasn't friendly, not overly chatty, and looked the granola part that I would expect for such a place. Incense burned in the corner, and peaceful Native American flute music played over the speakers. She asked how my stay was in Sedona, and told her I was enjoying the views and the hiking. I told her where I'd gone hiking to see the Anasazi cliff dwelling, and she walked to an old yellowed map on the wall and pointed to the site. This one? she asked, interested. I looked at her and said yes. She was pointing to the site I had visited. I looked next to where she pointed, about where the mesa was, and a very large red swirl was centred there. The map had several of those markings, mostly around the perimeter of the valley. I asked her what they marked, and she replied, Oh, those show where the energy centres are that the Native Americans discovered before the white men came to the valley. I hadn't told her about my trip up the mesa, but she must have sensed it from my facial expression, and asked, Did you see something up there you can't explain? I had to admit yes, and without inquiring she said, yeah, it's a pretty active place. 
I like to go up to the Mesa and get rejuvenated there, particularly when the weather is acting up. For a cynic like me, that was a pretty unsettling and simultaneously awesome day. I will tell you the story my Uncle Joe told me at Christmas a few years ago. He had arrived in a leg cast, and we all wondered why. Well, he worked for the Water Resources of the United States, U.S. Geological Survey, outside of Billings, Montana. Uncle Joe is a tall, lean, athletic man that ran five miles a day during the week before going to work. He is an avid outdoorsman. One day, he was out in the mountains leaning over a creek to collect a water sample when he heard a loud huffing noise behind him. He turned and saw a grizzly bear running towards him. Joe knew better, but instinct took over and he jumped into an adrenaline fueled sprint. He got two steps before the bear swatted his leg and hamstrung him. He collapsed to the ground and pretended to be dead. The bear stopped, sniffed a couple of times, then turned and ambled away. Joe didn't know why the bear had approached him, but his running away told the bear he was prey. Fortunately, the bear wasn't hungry that day. I went camping in Big Sur, California with one of my best friends. It was off season and a Sunday night, so the place was practically empty. We picked a campsite about a half mile walk from the ocean. It was in a huge open field surrounded by a lush forest. In the background, were limestone mountains, and you could hear the crashing of the ocean's waves. Very epic. We spent the night around a campfire, telling stories and eating. We're both pretty experienced backpackers. We are very diligent in ensuring we do not leave any traces of food by our sight, and almost everything other than our essentials go into the bear box. I have my dog with me too. She's leashed around one of the few trees in the field on a long metal leash and full harness. It's a full moon out and it was pouring beautiful blue light across the field. It was absolutely pristine and breathtaking. At around 1 p.m., something spooks my dog. Now, she's used to the woods and has an incredibly calm demeanor. But I mean, she is flipping out, tugging hard on the leash, as if she's desperate to escape. And she does. She pulls so hard that her harness snaps and she goes bolting across the field into the wilderness. I lose my cool. I drop everything and bolt after her. I am not thinking straight running into the woods at night. My only concern was getting her, even if it meant risking my own safety. I rescue her, and I find her curled in a random clearing in the woods looking ashamed and terrified. Thank God she ran in a straight line. Otherwise, I would have been totally lost. I walk back carrying her, and my heart is pounding furiously at the horror of the idea of her being lost in the wilderness forever. The thought is now unbearable. I can feel her heart pounding too in my arms. She is legitimately terrified. I am no longer in a great mood. We all head to bed in my tent, but my dog won't lay down. She refuses. Her ears are up, and she's staring intensely at the tent wall, as if she could see through it and is tracking something. It takes a while for my nerves to calm down from after the chase. 
I'm working hard at taking deep breaths. I'm reminding myself that I'm prepared for anything that I could encounter. That my dog is simply spooked from maybe a raccoon. Maybe she's just exhausted and acting up. And that is when I hear it. The cackling. A high-pitched laughter that is full of disgusting types of joy coming from outside my tent. My senses go on high alert. My body tenses up so tightly. It's like I'm about to break in half and I cannot even breathe. And then I hear more cackling, like a group of witches were doing something evil just yards away. It fills my hearing, laughing and laughing and more laughing. It's loud and just sounds so wrong. I can't even bring myself to move to look at my friend. It's like my entire body has given up. The laughs are then followed up with blood curling screams. It honestly sounded like someone was being murdered. It was full of panic and horror and sadness. Dear God. It could have been wolves or coyotes killing their prey, but it sounded so distinctly human. The laughter, the sobbing, the screams. Finally, my friend says, what the hell? I even begin to laugh a little because the situation was so intense and wild. I had no idea how else to react. I couldn't handle this. I suggest that we bolt for the car. It's a mile away, so we decide to wait it out. We just listen to the laughter and screaming until it fades away. And even when it's over, I don't bother going out of bed. I was performing research on various tree bacteria in the woods when a shirtless, heavyset man comes out of nowhere with a seriously dangerous looking axe. He's sweating and smiling as though he has just got done chopping. Mind you, we're in the middle of nowhere between two bordering states. It's uncommon to see anyone other than patrol. Like a bumbling idiot, I announce my feelings and inquire about his axe. His response? Yeah, it's pretty sharp. No problem cutting through somebody if you're not careful. Immediately I note out of there, walking at the brisk